On this edition of Around BCC, giving back to the community is the focus of the college's Center for Civic Engagement. Health science students, among others, will benefit from this year's one book, and we profile a history faculty member on the doorstep of another election. Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. It's full steam ahead at all campus of Bristol Community College as we enter our second month of the fall 2012 semester. There's been a push for many decades now to get people more involved in their community. And BCC has been involved in that and trying to get students engaged in not only what they do in the classroom, but getting engaged in activities outside the classroom. And that's the purview that falls under the Center for Civic Engagement. And that's going to be our topic for the first few moments of the program this month. I'm pleased to be joined by Jan Boulay. She is the coordinator of the Center for Civic Engagement here at BCC. And I'm also joined by Brandy Evans, who's a student here at Bristol Community College, who's been very engaged in service learning and community service activities since she's been a student here. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Jen, let me start with you. Um, the Center for Civic Engagement, in a nutshell, what is it and how can students get involved? Sure. Um, it basically encompasses both community service and service learning. Everything will pretty much fall under one of those two categories that we offer. And in terms of community service, that is volu um, volunteering in the community for a nonprofit organization. And for service learning, it is tied to an academic course. So the minimum requirement we have is 10 hours over the course of the entire semester. And then they do a reflection assignment with their professor. Now, was that for service learning? That is or? for service okay, learning. So service learning is, in effect, some sort of service in the community that's tied to a specific course, mm -hmm. where community service is just volunteering for, in, a, for right. a nonprofit organization that may be in the community, and students get credit for those two types of things, correct? Yes, they just don't receive academic credit, so right. it's not noted on their transcript in right. that case. Now, let's go back to the service learning component where it's tied to a course. Um, give us some examples on how some professors and some courses are getting students involved in getting uh, help with their coursework by doing this community service. Oh, sure. We have a variety of different um, options and we have some courses where it's actually embedded in the courses, such as the dental hygiene program, mm -hmm. where all of the students are actually involved in some type of a community um, dental clinic, I guess it is, and they work in that capacity. And that helps reinforce the skills that they're learning in the classroom by applying it somewhere out in the field. And then we have other instances where students find out about service learning and they approach their professor and say, I'd like to get involved in this. And they may be the only student in the class that's doing that. We've had some students, for instance, who may be involved in early childhood education or something, and they may volunteer for the Be Enriched After School program where they're actually applying skills in the classroom as a teacher of 10 or so students. Now, community service are, are projects that just students can get involved mm -hmm. and pretty much do good in their community. Absolutely. Um, what are some of the projects that some students have taken advantage of? And we'll talk a little bit in a moment about a recent fair that was held here on campus mm -hmm. to, to try to marry students with potential volunteer right. opportunities. Right. Um, we've had a variety of different options. We've had Project Cinderella where students have collected used prom gowns and donated them to, for instance, it would be Gifts to Give in, in New Bedford was one of the organizations. And that's a repurposing center which would then distribute those to young girls who were in hi area high schools who could not aff afford to go to the prom otherwise. That would be one type of project. We've had food drives. We've had a variety of different things in the past. So it's run the full gamut. Let's talk about that opportunity fair that was held in September on sure. campus. Uh, there were probably a couple dozen um, yeah, there were, organizations here. Yep, that's probably a good figure, yep. And um, it's an opportunity for students who may be looking at some of these volunteer opportunities to get in touch with some of these organizations. Mm -hmm. How successful has that been and, and how do you try to engage more of those partners to get involved with BCC's civic engagement and service learning opportunities? Sure. As far as our established community partners are concerned, we have them all listed on our website, which okay. is on the BCC website. 
and in terms of recruiting new partners in some cases we may contact them sometimes we may be at a regional meeting or something like that and approach them and ask would you like to be a community partner um, for our students and then in other cases Students have, may have volunteered for a nonprofit agency that is not a community partner with us, but they have decided at that point they would like to join on board. So, and there are always more opportunities for students, and you know, and we'll talk. Absolutely. I think we'll talk to Brandy now about her her participation in service learning and community service over the years. So, Brandy, first a little bit about yourself. Uh, where do you live, and and what do what do you what are your majors here at BCC? Uh, I live in Taunton, Mass, and I major in general studies, paralegal studies, and I'm pursuing our global leadership certificate that's through the Civic Engagement Office. Okay, we'll talk about what that is in a moment, but okay. talk about some of the opportunities that you've been able to afford yourself through community service and service learning. Well, through service learning, I've had the chance to serve as a peer mentor, which was beneficial to, to not only to the other student who I got to mentor, but to myself. And I also got to work over the summer with Jen. We did uh, the Mobile Food Mart, which was helpful. And um, I now am going to be participating as an AmeriCorps student leader. So I'll be leading another project this year. And all of that has been through the Center for Civic Engagement. It's been pretty beneficial. I have the service learning notation on my transcript so that people know that I'm out in the community participating and doing extra work for my classes. So it's, it's been great. Let me ask you, what interested you about doing this type of work, about this community service and service learning project? Um, I've always done community service. Like in the past, I, I've participated at my son's school, et cetera. But um, when I found out, because I, I didn't find out my first year, so when I found out that BCC offered um, community service and service learning and the chance for students to get the notation on their transcripts and just that they were recognizing students who were participating, I kind of sought out Dr. Zahm and asked her if I could be involved and she said absolutely and I've been in the center ever since. And you're even a, a work study student there yes, now. Yes, so I actually am. Literally in the center. Yes, almost I'm every in day. the center. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Once you get them, you just keep them around. Yeah. Let me ask you though, Brandy. Um, how does it make you feel to give back? And and a lot of students have experienced this, but I want want to hear it from you. It's really fulfilling. It is. It, at the end of the day, like I, you know, if my participation was minimal, or if I led the project it still feels great at the end of the day to know that I helped someone like when we did the mobile food mart it felt really great like we helped a lot of people in the community and at the end of the day I'm like that was awesome like a lot of people now have goods in their home that they wouldn't have had had we not had that food mart and the same with like peer mentoring like I helped a student throughout the semester and eased you know that student into BCC and made get, got a chance to make that student feel welcome and to learn about what we offer at BCC. Mm. So it, it it really is fulfilling. Like not only for on the other side where it's beneficial because you're volunteering for someone else, but at the end of the day, you feel great. Mm. So it's pretty good. Jen, the Center for Civic Engagement mm -hmm. has been around for over five years now. Um, what are some of the typical numbers? How many students approximately are involved, say, on a given year to, for either service learning or, uh, or, or community service projects? Sure. We tend to, service learning is the biggest program that we offer. Right. We have um, probably about four to six hundred students any given, four, four to six hundred students any, any given year for that. And the number of hours they actually put in, that can really vary. The right. minimum requirement is 10 hours, but th it does in fact vary. But it's in terms of service hours, we've also done the President's Volunteer Service Award, and for the past year, there were only 13 students involved, but they put in a significant amount of hours where we anticipated it was probably like $65,000 worth of um, hours that they had given back if you calculated that at the minimum, aid, um, minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. Now, Brandy had mentioned that there are, um, even though the service learning and community service isn't necessarily listed as a credit on mm -hmm. an official transcript, there is a mention that there's been some community service and service learning time yes. that this student has undertaken. And that's got to be a benefit to when students go on to either further their education or even to get a job. Wouldn't, wouldn't oh, it? absolutely. It does list, if it's service learning, it's listed as a service learning component underneath that course on the transcript. Right. So folks do end up knowing that they've put in this additional time and that they've actually worked 
within that type of field, they've had some experience. So it is huge. It is very beneficial for students, both in terms of applying to four-year schools or even applying to jobs afterwards. And uh, you mentioned briefly about some of the recognitions that students <laughs> may be able to get by you know, taking part in service learning or community service. Um, Brandy is part of the Global Leadership Certificate Correct. What is that, Jen, and how can students get more involved? Sure. We have all of this information actually listed on right. our website. And we'll list but, that on the screen. Okay, fantastic. Um, in terms of the Global Leadership Certificate, there are only 15 credit hours that are required in, in terms of that. And three of the courses, so that's nine credits right there, are electives within their concentration to begin with. So they're already taking that. Good. And so really what it comes down to is two additional courses that they take. One course would satisfy a global what was awareness, it? Global awareness um, general education requirement. And then the other one would either be the global leadership course or it would be the honors course in and community, community leadership. Yeah, community, yes. yeah. <laughs> There's too many words. Too many <laughs> service learning, community service. You're all doing well, doing good for the community. It's like 271 and like 295, which yeah. simplifies it's like it. It's even more technical, though. <laughs> more technical. But so, so after that, it's actually a certificate that is sort of the, a, a level above just doing some service learning in a course. Now, for the, the coursework that is part of the Global Leadership Certificate, you, you said it's in their discipline. Mm -hmm. Um, I would think that within those courses there needs to be a service learning component that's part of those courses, is that? Right. The service learning tends to be within the global leadership, whatever the leadership courses that okay. they're doing, because then it becomes more of a capstone project that they're working on and they're able to apply something meaningful out of that. Okay. And there's also some opportunities via the uh, Community Service Leadership Program mm -hmm. and also a President's uh, volunteer service program. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of programs, but they're all good. They're all so good. So talk a little bit about those other two and how students can get recognized. Certainly. The Community Service Leadership Program, that actually started back in 2008. And that program, um, basically you have to have either done service learning or community service in the past. And then from there, you will either do a leadership training, which we tend to offer once a semester, or you would take one of those two courses that I have messed up. <laughs> you take one of those two courses and then from there you would end up designing and implementing a project that meets the need in the community. Right. And you would lead five peers on that project. So with that it's something that is a lot more meaningful for students because it's something that is more related to their interests, their career goals and different things along those lines. And in terms of recognition they receive a red cord that they're able to wear at commencement mm -hmm. Um, and they are publicly recognized and it's noted in the program as well. And the Presidential Volunteers? Yeah. The President's Volunteer Service Award, that's actually open to the entire BCC community. So if you not have... Not just students. Not just students. Staff. You as well. If you have community service hours, <laughs> absolutely. The way that that program works is anyone involved in the BCC community would have to have served a minimum of 100 hours over the course of the previous calendar year okay. and the way that the year runs it would run from February to February. You would submit the contract in um, March so it would be March 15th of 2013 and there are different levels based on the number of hours of service and what your age is right. and so it, it's great because in terms of that award they receive a lapel pin um, it could be a bronze, silver depending on the number of hours of service but they also receive a letter from the White House signed by President Barack Obama, and they also receive a certificate with that. So that's great for even listing on their resumes when Absolutely. they're applying to jobs, and it's a huge honor. Now, in, in terms of, of going forward, we talked a little bit about how you try to outreach to, to more community partners to get them involved in community service. Mm -hmm. And I would think that a lot of the programs that have a service learning component may already be in tune with some partners that they work with Absolutely. as part of their classes. Um, so I, I guess the question to you, Jen, is, is, is if there is a nonprofit organization, service organization, a potential partner, can they get in touch with you to say, hey, add us to the list, and how easy Absolutely. is that? Absolutely. Is that, is that all it takes? It's easy breezy. <laughs> That's all it takes, right? Um, basically, if they visit our website, we do have a link for community partners specifically. Okay. And on that, there's a brief form that they end up filling out, indicating what their needs are, what types of services they're hoping that students would end up filling, and if there are any prerequisites, such as a Cori check that would need to be done prior to that, and then we will touch base with them. 
Well, that's great. And Brandy, I want to ask you one final question. Um, if there are some students who may be watching this mm -hmm. who may think, well, you know, I, maybe I'll, I want to get involved with some community service of some sort, either be through a class at service learning or just community service, what would you tell them in terms of taking that step and getting involved? I would definitely recommend it. I would tell them to stop by the Center for Civic Engagement, see me, see Jen, and I will help them out. I mean, it's beneficial for the, for res, I mean, it's a resume builder. It's it's beneficial for their transcript, and it's personally beneficial. So any students who were interested, I would definitely recommend that they take the first steps. And I mean, I'll help them along the way. I'd help them find a community partner, something that fits their schedule, and try to make it happen. <laughs> and Jen, I would also think that with some school departments requiring some high school community service, mm -hmm. that this would be an easy thing for some of the students that are coming through high school now to just continue that at BCC. Absolutely. The interesting thing too is as I talk to students in the classroom because we do some pre um, in-class training for, for service learning as faculty members end up requesting it and the interesting thing is most folks are actually doing a lot of community service but they don't connect it as such. Right. Yeah. So. So if anyone has any uh, questions or comments about uh, civic engagement here at BCC, again, go to the website, which is on the bottom of the screen, or you can call the college, 508-678-2811, extension 2459, and you'll probably talk with either Brandy or Jen. They'll probably <laughs> right. pick up the phone. Jen and Brandy, thank you for joining us. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Pat. We'll be back with more around BCC right after this. Welcome back. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick has announced the allocation of $4 million in grants to state community colleges to support increased workforce skills training, improve student outcomes, and other efficiency initiatives. BCC is slated to receive just under $300,000 to improve developmental education and increase student retention. It's been a year since BCC announced plans at the Fall River and New Bedford campuses to work with high school dropouts and getting their high school diplomas while also earning college credit. The programs have been a success as we enter year two. There are a total of 28 new students registered this semester in the BCC Middle College program in New Bedford, where dropouts are returning to school to earn their high school diploma while also earning credits for college. Middle College Director Frank Romanelli says after one year of operation, Middle College is being met with success. We have our returning students who started last fall and spring, and five of them graduated in June um, from our fall cohort. Uh, three of those are now full-time students at BCC, two here and one in Fall River. And the two that are here are actually doing tutoring um, through TASC. They got trained this summer and are working in our library as tutors. So I'm very excited about all that. Um, and the rest of the students are, are continuing to work toward their diplomas. Some will finish in December, some will finish in May, and others will go on to next fall semester and finish. So, The Gateway to College program in Fall River is yielding similar results. The program has 35 students this semester, with one recent high school graduate attending BCC and also serving on the Student Senate. Director Eric Bauman says the response to the program has been significant. The community response has been f fabulous. Um, with a lot of outreach and the help of um, uh, college communications, we've been really to get, out the, get the word out, um, working uh, a strong partnership with the Fall River Public Schools. Um, with any program, it's really hard to kind of build uh, awareness of it. And from our first semester to our second semester, we saw a, 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 a really strong increase in interest in the program in terms of inquiries and attendance at our uh, information sessions. So it's, it's, we're, we're moving forward. The Middle College and Gateway to College programs will be accepting new applicants for enrollment in January. For the fourth year, BCC is sponsoring the One Book Project, where curriculum and events are developed around the context of one text. Through a process of nomination and voting, this year's one book is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. 
Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman whose life was cut short by cervical cancer. Some of her cancer cells were harvested for research, cells which are still alive today. Arthur Skloot used the story of the everlasting cancer cells to tell the story of Henrietta's life. One Book Project committee member Sally Gabb says the book has cross-disciplinary interest here at BCC. We felt that it would reach a really large audience because it appeals to uh, both people in it has historical rele relevance, it's a very human story, but it's also very scientific. It deals with the health science area, so it's being used this year by a lot of the health science uh, disciplines, which is a great thing for us. The One Book Project has a number of events planned through this fall semester. Check out the BCC website for more information. We're beginning a new segment this month which will appear periodically on the show going forward. We have in the past focused on a famous BCC alum. Well this month we thought we would change focus and look at a member of the BCC faculty. With the election less than a month away, it's timely that we spotlight a faculty member in the history department. Hi, I'm Don Kilgus. I am an associate professor of history and government here at Bristol Community College. I grew up in Cranston, Rhode Island. I think I've always been interested in history. My grandmother, I think, helped me in that regard a great deal. I grew up a lot in, um, and uh, we used to travel a lot to um, Wickford, Rhode Island, which is a little seaport um, in North Kingstown that has so much history. And my grandmother used to talk to me a lot about the Great Depression time period and her growing up and things like that. And I think she really helped to get me interested in history and in general and in government and in things like that. Um, so I've always been interested in it, but I always thought, as everyone told me, you'll have history as a um, hobby, but you'll find something else to do, like a lawyer or something of that, de that degree. Um, but I never had the interest to stay, you know, to be, really investigate law too much. I did a little bit, but never really was too interested in it. When I was an undergraduate at Providence College, I said, well, let me just go in as a history major and see what happens. I never left being a history major at Providence College. And then I went on to grad school, although I did minor in business. My heart was always in education, I think, and the thought of teaching. I used to look at my college professors and say, I like that. If I, do, if I ever get to do that, I want to do it like that. But I don't like this, so I want to do that. And I always tried to pick and choose and, and to think in developing my own style, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. So when I graduated, I uh, went on to grad school and one of, the, um, one of the most important things for me for grad school was the, f the chance to become a teaching assistant, where I actually would get in the class and find out early on if I really wanted to teach or not. And I realized I really liked it. I think the students responded to me very well. And ever since then, I've been teaching. Although I love all aspects of history and have taught all different aspects of history too, my love has always been U.S. history, whether it be um, the Revolutionary Time Period or the Civil War or World War II, or whether it be social, multicultural history, uh, or about the government and the institutions. I've always found that most interesting to me to really try and understand how we have evolved from what either the Founding Fathers wrote in 1787 or what Jackson did while he was president in the 1820s, 1820s or 30s, or Lincoln or, or whatnot, to how we got to where we are. And I, I try and, and get that through in my classes too, where I try and have my students recognize not just what the history was and what the story was, because I really think history is a story, but also how it impacts us today. I was able to uh, start teaching a couple courses immediately um, when I graduated from um, grad school in 1992 and they were at uh, CCRI. And then slowly I started building more schools that I became you know, familiar with in terms of my alma mater, Providence College, um, that I began teaching there. And then I had a bunch of teaching positions as an adjunct at you know, Dean College and a whole bunch of other places in between, which gave me a great experience and a great wealth of, of knowledge to really build on, to then bring to BCC when I came here full time. I was, I was so um, happy and for the opportunity that Ray LaVirtue, who was the former Dean of Division II, um, gave me um, to come here as an adjunct. Um, and I finally was able to come here in 1999. And then in 2008, um, under Dean Fred Rocco, I was hired full-time. And I teach all the government courses, uh, the U.S. government, 
comparative government and urban government, and I primarily teach the U.S. history surveys, the uh, U.S. history two and since 1877. I've created and, and tried to offer a presidential elections course that unfortunately hasn't run um, yet, but I'm hopeful, and maybe if I tweak, tweak it a little bit and advertise it differently, maybe that'll go forward, um, I hope, and thinking about trying to develop some other courses as we go along down the lines um, as well. So it's, it's, uh, there's so many things I'm interested in that sometimes it's tough to narrow it down to just specific things that sometimes you can offer in a course. Um, but I see the interest that my students have on some things and I think, well, maybe I can take that and, and try and deliver something that they might like as an elective down the line. I always have my colleagues in the math department who talk about math anxiety when students enter their class. And I have a lot of students that enter my history or government classes and they have a huge history anxiety because they had to memorize all these dates in the past and things like that. So the one thing that I really try and do to make it interesting, uh, to make it interesting, I try and make it fun. I try and include all the stories. I try to include all the little tidbits that you don't really get in textbooks. Um, the sordid details sometimes, I guess I could, you could say it that way. Um, the little quirks of history, the trivia and try and really make it into a story so they can really see it. And I think if you can lead the students, because I always believe in the Socratic method of trying to ask the right questions to get them to get to their own conclusions. If you can, using the Socratic method, help them to see that what happened then is significant today and is the reason we have what we have today, I think it makes, much more, it makes it much more real to them and I think they appreciate it much, much more. I think teaching here at BCC, I think it's a great experience. I think anyone who was ever interested in teaching, I would always say to, to, te to try and teach at a place like this because it is such a family atmosphere in so many ways. It's so um, supportive in so many ways. It's so open in so many ways as well that you have, and especially in, in, in my division but across the college campus, you have so many people that if you have a question or a concern are always there to help you. The, I think what I like about and what I love about the college as well is that it is an open enrollment so you get a variety of students and one thing that, that um, someone said to me when I, when I first started teaching here is he said you will have in your class you know students who belong at Harvard and Brown and students that are going to struggle in your class and that I think is really appealing to me too because you get not just the support from the folks here and your colleagues here but you also have the experience of being able to work with the students and for me that trying to sell and explain the history so I reach everyone those people that are the huge history fans and have read everything or watched everything they can on History Channel and those people that could care less about History Channel and I think that that trying to reach both of those and keep everybody engaged I think that's one of my greatest challenges the best part of teaching would be when you when you have those moments in class and they're they 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 come and you see them every semester and they're you know every now and again and depending upon the topic where you have that moment that aha where you see it in the students faces that that's what that means that's how it relates that's that's what i remember or they take a tidbit that they had heard and it now it relates to something else that they have done and now it makes sense to them or it makes it real to them for the first time I think for me that's one of the greatest joys of, of teaching is seeing that, that you can actually see it immediately and you get that immediate feedback. I think in addition it's those students that you know we all have on campus that will come to the office hours or will come and do the extra work and, and really work hard because they come in and they've been out of school for a while and they're just nervous, they're unsure of themselves but you can help them with their study skills, you can help them with their writing skills, and you see them progress. Everyone has so many challenges, you know, just getting to school sometimes every day, from family responsibilities to work to everything else, that to try to help them try and, and put it all together, um, it really means so much to me. And I, I'm just thankful for the opportunity, you know, that I, can, that I can do it here at BCC. That's all for Around BCC this month. We leave you today with a look back at the art exhibit Counter Tension at the Grimshaw Goodowitz Art Gallery in Fall River on display now through October 19th. I'm Keith Tebow. Thanks for watching.